The evolution of the U.S. presidency occurred in four distinct stages. Presidents of the Continental Congress of the United Colonies, Presidents of the Continental Congress of the United States, Presidents of the United States in Congress assembled, and Presidents of the United States under the current U.S. Constitution. The first Colonial Congress of Deputies convened on September 5, 1774 at Philadelphia's Carpenter's Hall. The members elected Virginia delegate Peyton Randolph as their first presiding officer or president. Randolph's Congress passed the Suffolk Resolves, halted exports to Great Britain, and passed the Articles of Association, which named the colonial body the Continental Congress. Henry Middleton, the delegate from South Carolina, a very wealthy planner, was elected the second president of the Continental Congress on October 22, 1774. President Middleton issued an address to King George III and also an address to the inhabitants of Quebec, requesting they send delegates to the Second Continental Congress. On May 20, 1775, the Second Continental Congress convened this time in the King's Philadelphia State House because New England was in open rebellion with the Crown. Peyton Randolph again was elected President of the Continental Congress, but as before, he had to return early to Virginia for House of Burgess's business. The following day, after much deliberation, the members elected John Hancock, a wealthy Boston shipping merchant, President of the Continental Congress of the United Colonies of America. On June 15, 1775, Hancock lost his bid to combine the presidency with the new office formed by the Continental Congress, Commander-in-Chief. On that date, the delegates chose Virginia Delegate Colonel George Washington as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army. The presidency would remain bifurcated until 1789, when the office was finally combined with Commander-in-Chief under the second U.S. Constitution. It was not until July 2, 1776 that 12 of the colonies declared themselves free and independent states. On July 4, they passed the Declaration of Independence, and New York made the independence unanimous on July 9th. John Hancock was now the first president of the Continental Congress of the United States of America, and he served until October 29, 1777 resigning during the final deliberations of the Articles of Confederation. On November 1, 1777, they elected Henry Lawrence from South Carolina as their second president of the Continental Congress of the United States of America. Lawrence served until December 9, 1778, with his Congress passing two important pieces of legislation, the Articles of Confederation, the first U.S. Constitution, and the Franco-American Treaty. The Articles of Confederation, although passed by the delegates on November 15, 1777, required unanimous ratification before the old Continental Congress could be replaced with the new constitutional government called the United States in Congress Assembled. The ratification was painstaking due to state border disputes, so the Continental Congress continued to govern, now in Philadelphia, and elected John Jay from New York as its third president on December 10, 1778. John Jay would serve until September 28, 1779, resigning to accept the position of U.S. Foreign Peace Minister to Spain. On September 29, the delegates elected Samuel Huntington the fifth president of the Continental Congress. Huntington would serve in this capacity until the ratification of the Articles of Confederation on March 1, 1781. The following day, the old Continental Congress was dissolved, and a new constitutional government, called the United States in Congress Assembled, convened with Samuel Huntington serving as the first President of the United States under the Articles of Confederation. Due to illness, President Huntington resigned, and on July 10, 1781, Congress elected Samuel Johnson of North Carolina President, and he declined the office. Undaunted, the delegates elected Thomas McKean from Delaware, the second president of the United States under the Articles of Confederation. President McKean served until November 5, 1781, with his Congress creating the post of U.S. Secretary of Foreign Affairs and the U.S. Secretary of War. During his presidency, General Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, Virginia, effectively ending the Revolutionary War. On November 5, 1781, a new Congress convened and elected Maryland delegate John Hansen as the third president of the United States in Congress Assembly. John Hansen served the prescribed one-year term limited by the Articles of Confederation with his Congress establishing the Bank of North America and the Great Seal of the United States. 
For over 200 years, the state of Maryland has made the argument that this was the true first Congress under the Articles of Confederation, and therefore, John Hansen is the first President of the United States. This is historically inaccurate because on March 1, 1781, all 13 states, including Maryland, sent delegates after each state had already ratified the Articles of Confederation, formally adopting the new Constitution. Additionally, John Hansen was not the first black U.S. president. The picture of John Hansen as a black moor that has proliferated the Internet is actually an 1856 photo of John Hansen, the Liberian senator, who championed the relocation of slaves to Liberia, Africa, 75 years after President John Hansen's death. On November 4, 1782, the Third United States in Congress assembled, convened, and elected Elias Boutinot of New Jersey as its president. Under President Boutinot, the Congress would relocate the capital to Princeton due to mutinous Pennsylvania troops surrounding Independence Hall. They ratified a treaty with Sweden and learned their commissioner successfully negotiated the Treaty of Paris, ending the war with Great Britain. On November 4, 1783, Thomas Mifflin was elected the fifth president of the United States in Congress assembled. Mifflin would serve until November 2, 1784, with his Congress accepting George Washington's resignation as U.S. Commander-in-Chief. He also ratified the Treaty of Paris as president of the United States and opened up Far East trade by commissioning the Empress of China to establish diplomatic ties in Canton. This accomplishment was recognized by President Barack Obama at a Shanghai, China town hall meeting. Unfortunately, the president maintained private citizen George Washington, instead of President Mifflin, sent the 1784 trade mission to China. However, America's ties to this city and to this country stretch back further to the earliest days of America's independence. In 1784, our founding father, George Washington, commissioned the Empress of China, a ship that set sail for these shores so that it could pursue trade with the Qing Dynasty. Washington wanted to see the ship carry the flag around the globe and to forge new ties with nations like China. On November 30, 1784, Congress elected Virginian Richard Henry Lee, the sixth President of the United States in Congress Assembled. Lee served until November 23, 1785, with his Congress adopting the important Western Land Ordinance. John Hancock was elected the seventh President of the United States in Congress Assembled on November 24, 1785. Due to illness, his office was assumed by two chairmen, David Ramsey of New York and then Nathaniel Gorham of Massachusetts, who was later elected the 8th President of the United States in Congress Assembled. Gorham's Congress authorized the purchase of West Point. They adopted the Indian Affairs Ordinance. They received the important report on the Annapolis Convention. And they were severely challenged by open rebellion in the President's home state of Massachusetts, led by Captain Daniel Shays. Congress, under the threat of rebellion, recessed in the fall of 1786. They were unable to form a quorum in November, December, and January, reconvening the government on February 2, 1787. On that date, they elected former Revolutionary War Major General Arthur St. Clair as the ninth President of the United States. Despite this ominous beginning, in which many Americans thought marked the end of the Perpetual Union, 1787 would end as the most eventful and enlightened legislative year in United States history. St. Clair's Congress would call for the Philadelphia Convention to revise the Articles of Confederation, enact the Northwest Ordinance, and finally adopt the Convention's recommendation to dissolve the U.S. Confederation by sending a new Constitution, unaltered, to the states for ratification. St. Clair's term ended October 29, 1787, with his appointment as governor of the new Northwest Territory. On January 22, 1788, the last Congress convened under the Articles of Confederation and elected Cyrus Griffin of Virginia as the nation's 10th U.S. President. Under Griffin's Congress, the new Constitution was ratified, and they established a plan for dissolving the old Confederation and implementing the new Constitutional Republic. On March 4, 1789, a new government went into effect. George Washington was inaugurated as the President and Commander-in-Chief of the United States of America on April 30, 1789. On March 29, 1790, Rhode Island ratified the current U.S. Constitution, which met the 13-state requirement under the Articles of Confederation 
for its proper dissolution. Thanks for webbing in. This is Stan Close.